Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media downloads, go to pond5.com slash frame rate. vapid people and I just wonder why don't you play music videos anymore thanks Natalie dear Natalie are you f***ing kidding me should we all preserve your precious sleepover moments spent watching promotional material from record labels in amber like the mosquitoes in Jurassic Park the answer is f*** you I'm gonna break it down for you and every other person born before 1995 otherwise known as not our f***ing demo anymore So we can all finally put this behind us. Yes, back in the day, we earned our brand credibility by breaking new artists, but music videos were only worth making if they had actual promotional power behind them. And the game has changed. Your generation, not the one before you, not the one after you, your generation decided to steal music. And music videos are more worthless than ever before. Puff Daddy used to be able to drive a speedboat through an explosion. At least that looked cool. Now you're... Welcome to the episode of Frame Rate, named after our favorite highway on near the coast of California, 101. I'm Tom Merritt. I Merritt's. thought it was named for the room that harbors our darkest fears. <laughs> <laughs> also, a dual a dual meaning to today's yes, show. <laughs> indeed. And, by, and that's one of my darkest fears. Hey, by the way, I'm Brian Brushwood, and that opening clip is uh, just look for why doesn't MTV play music videos? Yeah, what anymore? was with that industry propaganda you were playing before the show? Oh, my God, it's so good. It's so good because it's such a cliche question, like, why doesn't MTV play music videos anymore? And uh, I, I'm certain that that's an actor and this is all fake, but it's like it lays out with, with heavy-duty science for three minutes straight why you're just totally screwed on music. And now they've got this whole thing called YouTube and Pandora and social media. And the, the entire relevance, the entire thing that we remember about MTV is totally gone. And then it breaks down at the end, and he says, but that's not what this is really about. It's because you're afraid of getting old. And he goes off for 30 seconds straight about how, you know, that's why we don't play Nirvana anymore is because you're getting old. You're getting, you're going to have to, I don't want to do it. I'm I'm not going to do it justice, Jason. Don't even zoom in on me. I thought you were doing all right with it. So, um, but but why don't why don't they play videos anymore? It doesn't seem like he answers the question. Oh, and, and you know what? That's one of the funny parts is I posted that on my Google Plus and uh, like half the respondents clearly didn't watch the video or if they did watch it, they didn't get it because they're like, yeah, why doesn't MTV play videos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, and it's actually hard in this environment to not get my back up at it when he's like, you know why they don't play videos? Because your generation steals music. And I'm like immediately like, no, actually, that is not the, that is not the game. But I know it goes on past that, and that's oh, the no, joke. No, yeah, and, it, yeah. it goes on way past yeah, it. Yeah. It's amazing. Actually, it's not because of that. So uh, before I do that, let's get into the big story. This just in, the big story. I've got a question, YouTube. Why aren't you funding this partner channel anymore? And the answer is because they didn't efficiently drive enough viewership to make it worth it. YouTube uh, has said they are deciding which channels are going to get new funding for the second year. They, they, they uh, funded something like 160 channels at an average of around a million dollars a piece. Uh, and they're now looking at them to say, we, we don't care if they're making money at this point, but we want to fund channels that are effectively driving viewership uh, and are efficient at doing it. They're not just wasting money. Uh, And this is all part of YouTube's uh, general strategy to get people to understand YouTube as a platform. So uh, you'll see a lot of the headlines here saying, YouTube acting like a regular television network and canceling scads of shows. And that's sort of true, but 
the, the reality behind this is YouTube is using this as a way to wean people off of other production models and get them to try YouTube. Eventually, YouTube doesn't want to have to fund anything directly. At least that's what they say. Uh, and, of course, full disclosure, uh, in a week, my wife becomes an employee of YouTube. Uh, that doesn't give me any inside knowledge at all. But I also do a show called Sword and Laser on the Geek and Sundry Network. And Geek and Sundry is a partner channel. I don't have any knowledge of their dealings with YouTube either. Yeah, no, and, and I don't want to. I don't want to presume what it's like to be uh, in in your position or some one of the people on the networks. I mean, certainly it's not good if you're funded by YouTube and you're not driving the numbers that you want to. But I will say, for this initiative as a whole, I cannot think of anything better as far as news because it says one thing. It says that Google cares about getting the most. They're, they're so committed to this idea of transforming the face of video that they're going to hold people's feet to the fire. This is not, they're not just shoveling Google money in the faces of dreamers who think that they can make something happen on the internet that they couldn't make happen on regular television. It's clear that they sincerely want to redefine what online video means, especially what YouTube means to the outside world. And this is, I think this is good news all the way around. And and the key here, too, is if you get can canceled, so-called canceled by, Google, by YouTube or Google, you're not canceled. They don't take away your channel. All they say is, we're not going to give you any more money for this channel. But you can continue to do the channel. If, you've already, if your channel has paid back its money that you got from YouTube with advertising revenue, then you're free to continue to make your channel and make money off of it by putting the advertising on there. Obviously, YouTube always takes a small cut of any advertising, but you'll get to keep a larger share of the revenue if you're not funded by YouTube because you don't have to pay that YouTube money back. So I don't know how much this played into the decisions, but some of these channels, this may be all they needed. Like, hey, we needed a, you know, a good close to a million dollars to get us off the ground, but they may fly now and, and not need the YouTube money. And that could be... Uh, a positive as well. But I, I, I do want to reemphasize that YouTube's criteria here are not money. They're not saying we're keeping the, you know, the, well, they're, they're, I think they're canceling 60% or they're not funding 60% of the channels. They're not keeping the 40% that made the most money. They're keeping the 40% that they said actively are gaining audience are, are, and are efficient with how they're spending their money. We feel like they're spending the money wisely. Uh, and one of the things they found in, in some of these articles I read, seems to be that the channels that do well are not celebrity names. It's not just throwing a famous name on there that makes a channel popular. It's certain kinds of content that are popular with the YouTube audience, and it's hard promotion. It's, it's getting out there and telling people what's on, when, and how to find it. Well, and keep in mind also, like, this is whatever YouTube is going to discover from this experiment. When they, when they uncover what it is that YouTube is, uh, there'll be surprises. I mean, to me, Machinima is one of the biggest surprises out there. The, and we've talked about this before. There are things that will fly on YouTube and be incredibly popular on YouTube that nobody would have believed. Uh, in fact, I saw some tweet. This is going to be very cliche and trite. But somebody says, uh, when coming up with new ideas, you want, to, uh, you want to go with the idea that everyone loves, but you should go with the idea that nobody understands. And I think that that's, this is a way to transform or to, to speed up the laboratory effect of YouTube to figure out what it is that YouTube can do exquisitely well that cable television cannot. Yeah, and so, uh, who is it in the chat room here? Uh, Bill Meeks actually saying, I always thought it was weird YouTube doesn't do much to promote the channels themselves. And I think that a lot of people who do the channels and people who like the channels uh, feel frustrated by that. But I get the sense, and this isn't something I know, but I get the sense that part of the reason is YouTube is trying to set you up for success. So they're like, we don't want to use the YouTube powers to pick winners and losers because we can't promote everything. When you got 160 channels, you're not going to be able to promote everything. So that's that's a bad, it's a bad idea to use promotion to force people to try to like one thing. This is the experiment phase. They're trying to figure out what content is uniquely perfect for the YouTube audience to take YouTube's uh, reputation to the next level. And for them to, to start off by throwing the money out and then immediately say, and we really want you to watch these would be bad. That's that's what you do to answer to shareholders who want to know what they're getting for their money. And, and this does not smell like a shareholder driven initiative at all. This seems like they genuinely want to transform the face of television on the internet. All right, let's uh, move to another big story which won't transform the face of television on the internet but it will transform Star Stop Wars. Stop everything. It's another big story. 
It'll transform my face into a big fat smile is what it'll mm-hmm. transform. Is it Michael Arndt who wrote Toy Story 3, which if you haven't seen Toy Story 3, uh, go see Toy Story 3 because it will make you cry. Uh, yes. He also wrote Little Miss Sunshine. It has been picked as the screenwriter by Lucas and Kathleen Kennedy for Star Wars Episode 7. Uh, by the way, uh, did, did you ever hear my theory about Toy Story 3 that was apparently refuted by the director of Toy Story 3? No, what was it? My my theory is, uh, spoiler alert, uh, that uh, that Woody totally dies in that melting pit in the garbage. Oh, no, I have heard you say this. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. But uh, it's the and Brazil- it's like his dream or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's his fugue state. Uh, yeah, man. Look, uh, here's the thing. Now, people are rolling their eyes being like, what? This guy, Toy Story 3, Little Miss Sunshine, that doesn't sound like Star Wars. Uh But think about it this way. What have we gotten since the original series? The original series, we had a shocking amount of character and heart mixed up in this dirty, filthy, war-ridden rebellion going on. And that's part of what we loved about it. In the prequels, we got all the trappings of Star Wars with wooden characters standing in front of green screens and relationships that we never, neither believed nor cared about and characters that we just, you know, we rolled our eyes. Like how much... Better would it have been if we loved and cared about Anakin, but instead we found him as the annoying whiny guy, and we were disappointed that this is who was underneath the Darth Vader armor. This is exactly what you need, is a character who knows how to write dialogue and engaging characters. Star Wars desperately, desperately as a franchise, needs new characters that we care about. And to be honest, like while I have been disappointed that a lot of the talk about Episode 7 has been about bringing back Luke and Han and, and Leia, it's like, you know what? The last thing I want as a Star Wars viewer is more callbacks to the previous episodes. And I'm hoping that this is the kind of writer who can create a new beloved cast of characters for us to take for the next 20 years. Well, And the, and the key to bringing back... Leia, Luke, and Han, is that they're brought back because the story demands it, not because they wanted to bring back Leia, Luke, and Han. Uh, and that's that's the kind of thing that Arndt seems like the kind of screenwriter who will say, uh, well, okay, there is a reason for this, so I will, wor- I will make that happen. But I, he wouldn't just, like, throw some crap together, like, oh, we booked Carrie Fisher, all right, let me like, cobble that onto the side here. Uh, in fact, Vulture... Uh, the website Vulture reports that they wanted to bring back those characters and they thought that uh, Arndt uh, has been giving talks and lectures on storytelling that would imply that he knew how to do that. And, uh, and Cyrus Farivar at Ars Technica says in the comments section of a discussion about one of the talks Arndt gave at the Austin Film Festival in 2010, he breaks down Star Wars in almost a red-letter media way except positive instead of tearing it apart. Uh, saying Star Wars A New Hope, the original, had a great ending because it resolved the story arc, internal, external, and philosophical story arcs, immediately after the moment of despair at the climax, delivering an insanely great ending. And he's like, the faster you can do all that, the, you, the more of a euphoric state you put the viewer in. And he claims Star Wars did all of that within a space of 22 seconds. Wow. That's amazing. You're so right. I hadn't really put that together before. Uh, Look, I mean, the guy's got massive credit in my bank, and he brings to the table something that uh, I think, like I had said before, Star Wars desperately needs. And uh, really, time will tell. I mean, we can can argue about this in two years. Yeah. I I had no idea. I'm glad you disclosed your financial relationship with Arn. I didn't know you had massive credit in your bank. Well, okay. Now you've now you've brought it on the table. Uh, he has art credit, and he can spend it in the bank, De Brian, where he can buy uh, love and affection. Ah, uh, it's like those little coupons you you make when you're a kid. <laughs> and a back rub. I and forgot. Hugs. He's got a coupon for a back rub <laughs> and let's, a clean room. Let's move on. He had another big story. Mister Art, you need to clean my room. I have a coupon. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. So we've been sort of following this uh, this Dish uh, lawsuit. Fox and NBC both uh, suing Dish for their auto hopper DVR. Remember us talking about that? That's the DVR that records everything in prime time on the major networks. And then 24 hours later gives you the ability to skip all the commercials when you watch the shows back. Now, a lot of the, the stories you'll see today miss this and I apologize if I'm getting the period of time wrong, but I know it's not an immediate thing. It's not like right after it airs, you can skip all the commercials. Uh, Fox tried to argue that Dish, or still tried to argue, frankly, that Dish is violating copyright by doing this. The judge in this case has denied a preliminary injunction. 
saying, no, I don't see how that this is an obvious copyright infringement, and so I'm not going to require Dish to stop selling the boxes during the trial. But they are still going to trial on this. It's not, it's not like Dish has won or Fox has lost. So here's the interesting thing, and I actually don't know what the story is on the windowing as far as when advertisers buy for how long they buy for. But let's take a show like on the Internet. Uh, let's take my, my series Scam School. Uh, Scam School, we have uh, an embedded sponsor in the middle of the episode. We do the trick, and then we take a moment to thank Netflix or GoDaddy or one of the other guys. Uh, and then, But we only get paid for, for a set amount of time. We'll say 45 days. After that moment... That content, no matter how many millions of people see it after then, we don't get a check from GoDaddy or Netflix or whoever. So weirdly, if, if, if this existed to go take the back catalog and instantly skip over the sponsor reads for all the, that back catalog, as a content producer, I would be thrilled because it would only enhance the, the, the value of watching the back catalog. And it seems to me like instead of hashing this out in court and having everyone go nuts about it, why couldn't they work an agreement saying, you know what, we don't really count viewership after 48 hours after this comes out. Uh, let's all get on the same page. And, you know, if you're not going to derive a benefit from it, then I don't understand why Fox is going to the mat on this outside of outside of them just being worried that it sets a dangerous precedent for skipping commercials. Well, there's so many ways to go with that discussion because uh, there's this GigaOM article that TV has the ability to do web-like ad metrics, exactly like you're talking about. And, and they're, they're dragging their heels on implementing them. I mean, Nielsen now has commercial ratings. They can rate actual commercial views, not just the, the show that the commercial is in. They're getting more precise. They're getting these web-like metrics. But the, but the industry is sort of resisting it because it's changed. The same reason they've been resisting the Internet in the first place. So there's that aspect of it. Where they're like, eh, no, we're just uncomfortable with you know changing the way this works. I know that Nielsen does a uh, a broadcast plus seven rating, uh, so that within seven days, any viewing uh, on a DVR of that show counts in the rating for that show. I'm not sure, and this is where we could use a Derek Chen email, perhaps. Uh, I'm not sure how valuable that rating is compared to the overnights. Uh, whether it's the majority of the of the money they get for the ad comes from the overnight rating versus the the plus seven rating, uh, but I know right. it's rated. Uh, it's just a it's it's again if it's it's all a, a part of this changing the way we do things that takes a long time because nobody gets rewarded for changing fast. Everybody well, he wants to go you know protect their job and and go slowly. But the good news is when that change does happen, I think it's going to happen very quickly. I think all of a sudden advertisers are going to be like, what? You're just giving us a general number and shrugging your shoulders and saying that you're pretty sure this is how many people watched? You know, we just talked to the guys over at Hulu and they're able to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, before we move on to another, uh, a, a lesser big story, there was something that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move up since we're talking about metrics. One of our uh, friends of the show over at uh, uh, somebody who may or may not work at Nielsen forwarded us a little bit of news uh, that uh, via tech crunch that Nielsen, in an effort to figure out exactly what the second screen experience gives the viewer and how they should monitor it as far as user engagement goes, uh, Nielsen just acquired a social guide to measure the impact of social TV. Did you get a chance to read this, Tom? No, I didn't see this at all. Uh, was yeah. this in the feedback section? Uh, no, no, no. This was, I snuck it in underneath. There, we didn't have a fifth and sixth big story, so I just put it at the bottom of everything. But now that we're talking about metrics and about television getting caught up, I thought I'd scoot it into this section right here. Oh, yeah. See, I don't procrastinate, so I never saw it. See, that's your problem. You need to start <laughs> procrastinating, Tom. That's your whole thing. Uh, but anyway, no, this but it is actually really got, it, it belongs in this, in this story because it goes right along with this. Sure, sure. And and I wish I had thought about that before the show started. Uh, but uh, basically, we don't know necessarily what's going to happen with this outside of it's good news. Anything in my book that Nielsen can do to recognize that TV viewing has fundamentally changed in 2012 uh, versus, you know, 1997. Uh, there's something fundamental that's different about the television living room viewing experience and the faster they can figure out what those are and how we can monetize them so that advertisers can pay for better quality content that is less intrusive with the ads, uh, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I, uh, I did see this in the headlines and I, I kind of skipped over it because I saw second screen. I think it was, it was part of my, my bias of like, eh, second screen, who cares? Nobody's ever <laughs> going to use it. Uh, but it, but we'll never know how to make the best use of it if Nielsen doesn't do stuff like this. It does tie well, right into that. 
And if that's your impression is that second screen schmeck and schmeen, mm -hmm. then, uh, then at least now we've got some science as far as figuring out like, well, what does what do people get out of it? To tie this all back to the original story about Dish and the auto hop, none of what we're talking about actually matters for the case because what Fox is doing and, and what we're talking about all applies to the motivation for Fox doing this. But what Fox and NBC are doing in court is asserting copyright violation. So maybe they're trying to stop ad sale degradation. But what they're arguing is that Dish and you as a Dish user don't have the right to do this. Uh, and that is where you get people like Public Knowledge and Free, free Press jumping in and saying, wait a minute, you record something at home. You have the right to do whatever you want with it. Uh, so if Dish wants to give you the ability to you know, detect uh, commercials and skip over it, that's your right. You, you have recorded it. It's in your house. They can't come in and tell you like, oh, you can't use the fast forward button on your VCR. That's, right. skipping, that's skipping commercials. This is just a more efficient way of doing that. So there's a lot more at stake in unintended effects in this court case uh, than just the ad model of the broadcast network. Keep that. Yeah, uh, John Bergmayer, an attorney of public knowledge, uh, recently took to Twitter. Uh, he said he hadn't seen the decision himself, but it is rumored to, quote, be good on fair use. I did the air quotes for all you guys listening at home. Yeah. And, it, and again, it's just uh, saying no injunction. We're, we don't believe that prima facie, this case uh, is obviously copyright infringement. So we're going to court. And that is a good sign for Dish. Right. Uh, finally, our fourth big story. Well, I mean, it is fourth, but <laughs> it's not, it's as least important on our graphic. I feel bad now. Uh, the IAWTV Awards were announced this afternoon by Shira Lazar on a special edition of What's Trending. Uh, and uh, I like covering these, uh, not because we get nominations. Tech News Today and This Week in Tech are up, uh, are nominated uh, for awards in the news category. But I like covering this because it's a great way to expose yourself to new web stuff that you probably didn't realize was there. I know a lot of people reacting to the, the, the stories about YouTube canceling partner channels were like, I didn't, I didn't realize this stuff existed. So best comedy web series, check these out. Husbands, My Gimpy Life, Squaresville, The Jeff Lewis Five-Minute Comedy Hour, that's Jeff Lewis from the Guild, by the way, and Wainy Days uh, are all, I, 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 I'm a member of IWTV and I voted on the nominations and these are all definitely deserving of their nominations and deserving of you going and checking them out. And best drama series, you're going to recognize some of these names, Aiden Five, H Plus, the digital series, Leap Year, The Booth at the End, Season 2, and The Division. It, this is so exciting. Uh, and, and by the way, we should point out that a friend of the show and your co-host on Sword and Laser is nominated for Best, uh, best Host. Uh, or I don't best, know hope, best. best Hope in a, in a taped series. So, yeah. In fact, I yeah. think Geek and Sundry got like seven nominations. Yeah, congratulations to Veronica Belmont on that. Uh, yeah, look, this is, and, and again, I'm the first to roll my eyes and say awards are all BS, but they are important because it's that BS structure that gives legitimacy to a platform. And uh, online video needs, needs, needs that kind of legitimacy if we're going to change the face of the way people watching. And if uh, we're, we're going to mention Veronica, we should mention Leo is up for uh, best host of a live of a live. Uh, Network. Yes, network. we should. And well, so I we, just did. No, we, congratulations to, to Leo, of course, as well. IAWTVAwards.org uh, is where you go to find out these nominations. And if you're like, okay, Tom, shut up. What the hell is IAWTV? <laughs> it's the International Academy of Web Television. They've been around for over five years. I've been a member since the very beginning. Uh, their whole point is to promote good web television. So this awards is sort of like just a slice of what they do. It's a good public face to get people interested, get people talking about web video. Uh, and Tech News Today won an award last year. So of course oh. I have positive feelings about that. Uh, but All it's right. just, it's a really good uh, organization for, for promoting high quality video on the web. Tom, can you prove, and this is, this is a movie I'm working on, so this is important. Is there anything you can say to me right now that would prove beyond a doubt that the IAW TV is not just a front for the Illuminati. Is there anything I can say to prove that? Yes. Yes. Can um, you prove it? No. No. In fact, uh, any more than we can prove any scientific theory, uh, Brian. See, I can, however, show you a preponderance of the evidence. Yeah. yeah uh, that's, that's not going to play. That's not going to play. Look, I'm really inspired. Remember that loose change documentary about the crazy 9-11 business? Yeah. This is it. 
The Illuminati is running the IAW TV. That's that's my new movie. That's I'm utter gonna... fiction, oh, Brian. It's utter fiction that the Illuminati is behind this. I don't even know how you'd illustrate that. Hey, man, look, I'm just saying, I'm just saying you do flashy pictures and play some slick music underneath and you get a bunch of quotes from people like you saying, I can't disprove that it's the Illuminati. And then I just fast cut it all together. But the problem is I need to up the production value here, right? I got to I gotta make it look legitimate. And I'm yeah, thinking you're like, never going to be able to pull this off, Brian, because you're going to need like really expensive helicopter shots of Los Angeles showing the secret headquarters and conspiracies of penguins on a beach talking to each other and sound effects of Illuminati. And where are you ever going to find any of that kind of stuff? I'll tell you where. Our friends over at Pond 5. Five. They go. They got. They got award shows. They got sunsets. They got. Uh, they got. They got uh, cityscapes. They got all that slick stuff. Here, I'm gonna. I'm gonna go to Pond Five right now. I'm gonna look for people award shows. Where right. we got? All right, Brian. I. I am absolutely and utterly against your Illuminati conspiracy uh, plans. But but I got to say, uh, our sponsor for Frame Rate Pond Five would would be a great place to, to find uh, stock photos and, and vector illustrations and sound effects. Um, and but you know what would be a better use of your time, Brian, than, than going around chasing these, these half-cocked theories would be to just make some professional quality, uh, you know, recordings of your own and, and, or in and around the Austin area. you got beautiful hill country there, and then you could sell them on Pond5 and, 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 and get top, rate, top royalty rates in the industry. So wait, I can make money just for just for footage I got laying around taking beautiful shots of downtown Austin. Yeah, 3D models that you've made, any sound effects, motion graphics, videos that you take of that beautiful pink granite of the Capitol building. You can you can upload that and make money off of it. Uh, developers use Pond5 for high quality sound effects for games. Designers use it to build everything from scratch, film and video makers. Uh, it, if you're like me and you're like, I hate the copyright system, but I know I have to play within it. So I want a place where I don't have to think about it. I don't have to let it get me angry about what's legal and what's not. Go to Pond5 and get royalty-free stock photos, videos, vector illustrations, sound effects, and you got them legal to use in almost any project you could think of. Right on, man. If only there was like a promotional code or website I could go to. Well, Brian, I'm glad you set me up to give the tagline for this commercial. <laughs> Because you can get 50 free stock media downloads at pond5.com slash frame rate. That's pond5.com slash frame rate. They've changed up how they do that. So pay attention. P-O-N-D, the number 5.com slash frame rate. And you get 50 free stock media downloads. That's a lot of stock media that you can now legally use. You can make a whole movie out of 50 free downloads. I'll tell you what, now that now that they're using the F word, I, I encourage people to actually do that. I want to see uh, the frame rate movie made entirely out of your free 50 clips over at Pond5.com. Yes. Uh, tweet us a link. Send, it, send us an email. Uh, we'll, show it, we'll show it. next. In fact, next uh, next time that we have Pond5 as a sponsor, we'll show your movie. The frame rate epic. Go make a movie. Do it. It's awesome. And now, time for the slipstream. Brought to you by Pond5. And now a Wes Anderson movie. Uh, YouTube's next live star could be you because you could become a codcaster. That's right. With the, uh, with the, uh, new, uh, the new uh, elements built into the latest hot video game, you can deliver high-quality streaming video of fish. <laughs> no, no, no. Call of Duty. COD. That COD. Oh, 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 it's, oh it's Black Ops 2. I see. Yes. Uh, so exactly. it's... Uh, no, but this is cool. So... It, it, lots of people have been doing this for a long time. There's all kinds of, of ways to, to stream your video game out onto the web. But with Call of Duty uh, Black Ops 2, it is built in on your yes. Xbox and, and I think on your PS3, right? Now, here's why. Well, right now it's you in You stream beta. right to YouTube. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you stream, I believe, to uh, I think it's a partnership with Twitch.tv, which is, of you course. You stream right to people's brains from your <laughs> video game. Now verify. So here's what's interesting about this. All of YouTube was sort of based on the idea that it could be just as fun to create uh, video content as it is to to consume video content. And this is that same idea taken to video games. Now, here, uh, we'll talk about this later on what we're watching. But for the last couple of nights, I've been live streaming my playthrough of the Walking Dead video game from Telltale Games. And it is electric and exciting to be in some way performing, but a part of something. And, uh, and in the case of Call of Duty, you never know 
when you're going to be on one of those epic tears where you just destroy everyone in your path. And we've all had that in video games where you're just in the zone and you feel electric and you just wish somebody was there to see it. Well, now you can virtually guarantee that. You go live and because you have an audience watching you, even if it's just two people, it changes the way you feel about the game and you get that electricity of performance. So this is in many ways... Uh, the first video game built-in feature to offer a fundamental game, literally game-changing uh, experience for the perform for the player because you're not okay, just. Okay, that's what show, what Jason is showing right now is a different story than what we're talking about, but they're very related because there is a live, there's a partnership happening between Electronic Arts, Sony, and Twitch. So the, the, and oh, that, wait, that's, that's what I was talking about. That's was, the whole point is there's different ways to do this now. Call of Duty Black Ops 2, it's built in that you can stream your video play right to YouTube, live on YouTube. YouTube, got it. But then there's also the partnership coming with Twitch, EA and Sony to do pretty much the same thing from the origin client on your PC. So it's, it's different ways of doing it. Got it. All right. Well, man, I just I just mashed them all up in in the same story in my mind. So I'm glad you were able to clarify that. But and this is what's cool is like the YouTube thing is saying, look, you don't want to mess with like screen captures, running special software on your on your on your PC. We're taking your console footage and running it through your PC. We're just gonna we're just gonna make it dead simple for people who want to do this and start a channel. And then Twitch, which has been doing this sort of thing for a long time. They are working with EA to say, let's, let's try to make it dead simple on the PC side uh, and say any, any games from Sony uh, just stream, you know, right through Origin to us. Uh, so it's, it looks like, uh, what, uh, Planet StarCraft II will be part of this? What? No, no, that's not, that's, that's, that's something, that's a different thing because that's Blizzard. Um, it looks like PlanetSide 2 is, uh, uh, yes. Planet is, is going to be uh, allowing users to tweak broadcast and quality settings from within the game client. Uh, let me tell you, the early buzz about Planet Side 2 is phenomenal. Full disclosure, my brother's actually working on the game um, in San Diego right now. But uh, but by all accounts, uh, the, the early beta participation has been insane. And I really look forward to playing that. So uh, the, the Call of Duty stuff is what's called cod piece casting. Uh, or did I, do I have that right? Cod, cod casting, cod, not cod piece. There's Call no Call of piece. Duty uh, casting. Uh, I, I, don't do the, I don't do that myself. Uh, not having, a <laughs> not, not that there's anything wrong with it. Right. God testing, you know, it's like it's uh, there, there's room for all of us here. Right. I'm not judging. Uh, also, not judging if you just want to decide to give Amazon more money per month than you than you need to. But uh, they've unveiled seven dollar ninety nine cent a month options for Amazon Prime. Now you still get the shipping deals. You still get the ability to lend Kindle books, and you also get the access to Amazon Prime streaming video. Uh, but instead of paying seventy nine dollars a year, you're going to pay Something on the order of ninety-eight dollars a year, ninety-five dollars and eighty-eight cents, actually. Uh, but you're but you're only paying a month at a time. So I guess the deal is, if you're not sure you can afford a whole year, you just pay for the eight dollars and go month to month. Yeah, this this makes sense. This is legitimate. It, I agree. It is kind of dumb. It's just like, do you just feel like paying more money to Amazon Prime? Then by all means, we now have an option for you. Well, and I think it's going after people who are like, well, it's eight dollars a month for Netflix. Or eighty dollars a year for Amazon. Well, I don't know if I want it for a whole year, and I've sure. got eight dollars this month. I'm not sure I've got eighty dollars to give all at once. Now they can say, "Look, you can pay eight dollars a month for Amazon too." Same, same exact deal. So if you're choosing, choose on another problem. Don't don't choose on the price. Right. Hulu is also imita everybody's imitating Netflix. Uh, Hulu is launching a dedicated kids channel. It's only available on the web to start with, but they say it will come to their iOS and Android apps eventually. 43 commercial-free kid shows. Yeah, no, that's good. More, uh, I'll tell you what, man, we've been using the crap out of uh, the Just for Kids feature on on Netflix. And now it's gotten to the point where the kids know, finally, you know, my five-year-old, she just turned five. And now she's able to load up the Xbox, go to the Just for Kids, and, and go to the picture that she wants, even though she can't read, which is awesome for a lazy dad who just wants her kids to be able to handle stuff on their own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wall Street Journal reported uh, late last week, or actually, like, early last week, just right after frame rate, that CBS considering streaming shows that are still on the air. Now, we've talked about how CBS finally did join in on Hulu, but they're only doing old series. They're only doing old seasons of stuff. Uh, but CBS now considering saying, look, the shows that are actually up, like Big Bang Theory, some of our, you know, CSI, Hawaii Five-0, we might stream those as well. Now, originally, the Wall Street Journal story implied that 
you would be able to get them, you know, within 24 hours of airing, just like you do with Fox and NBC and ABC. Well, actually, Fox delays it 28 days, but but that sort of situation. And CBS was quick to say, no, 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 no. We're we're talking about old seasons of currently airing shows. Uh, they're still holding off on the idea of putting current episodes up. Oh, dude, once they start slipping into that, that that once they pass the event horizon, they're going to be all in. This is all just putting toes in the water, and hopefully soon everything will take off. Well, and you know what? It's interesting. They point out in this article that CBS is the most exposed to the advertising market because they make, uh, I can't remember what the exact percentage is, but the majority of their money from advertising. They don't have a lot of other ventures uh, the way News Corp, which owns Fox, does. The way Disney, which owns ABC, does. CBS is CBS Corp. Uh, so they're, they're being a, a lot more cautious about the impacts to their advertising revenue. And it all comes back to that. Every time we talk about well, why isn't X happening, why isn't Y happening, it's all about making sure that you keep that advertising revenue river flowing in. And the majority of the money is still flowing to broadcast television or, you know, or, or cable television. It's not flowing to internet thing. television. The, the eyeballs are flowing to the internet, which means soon the advertising flows to the internet, which means soon the money flows to the internet. And it'll happen. It's going to be all in fits and jerks in the meanwhile. But I love that in, image of eyeballs flowing to the internet. Yes. The eyeballs are flowing to the internet. Don't step on them. It's time for tube tops. Uh, there's not a whole lot of actual, like, set-top box news this week, uh, but Nilay Patel over at The Verge uh, kicked off a special week of coverage on Over the Top, which is, of course, the industry term for getting your television shows over the Internet instead of getting them over a cable t uh, connection. And I, I read this today. I actually threw it in the lineup expecting to just say, like, oh, Nilay's got a cool article. Go check it out. It is incredibly well done. Uh, it is such a good overview of the main issues here. And, and he talks about how the Verge staff, a bunch of them, actually tried to spend the entire week uh, without cable and, and using the internet to get their shows. And, and, and they're going to explore over the course of the week some of the problems they had with that. But it's just an excellent explanation of like why this didn't happen, the problems with cable card and how that uh, reduced innovation. And, and he brings up the, the great point, Brian, that we have these amazing smartphones in a competitive marketplace that do amazing things. And yet our television system is still dominated by cable and satellite and, and is pretty much working the same way it was five years ago. Can you imagine if your phone worked exactly the same way as it did five years ago? Five whole years ago? That's back when I was in junior high. It's like, look, the, wor the world could change. Think about, the, think about what happens from junior high till your first year of college. That's five years. So uh, I guess your last year of junior high. Point is, five years is a very long time. And yes, it should get updated. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great series, uh, so, so definitely go check that out. Also, uh, Microsoft posted a job posting for something called Cloud TV. LiveSide spotted it. Uh, the preferred qualifications include experience with mobile and browser application development with iOS, Android, and Windows 8 RT, uh, part of Microsoft's interactive entertainment business. So, I mean, we know that Microsoft's really targeting your television through the Xbox 360 uh, as, as, a, as a way to get you into their universe and, and watch TV shows. But it looks like there may be some sort of grander plan to deliver television than even we may have suspected. Yeah, I, I feel bad. I haven't played with Smart Glass at all. That's available now, right? Yeah, yeah, through, yeah. Uh, I, through the Surface. You can, you can do it. And, uh, you? and you can download the iOS app as well, I think. You actually, you actually got a Surface. Have, have you played with that at all? I haven't. I haven't messed with it at all. All right. <laughs> I don't have an Xbox Live uh, paid account. What? All right. <laughs> I, I know. That's, that, that's what's holding me up. Uh, let's quickly move on to Film Found before I turn back. Uh, Peter Jackson's 48 frame per second version of The Hobbit, uh, also known as the HFR version, you'll see it referred to that, means high frame rate. Uh, that's the frame rate we do at 4 p.m. It's high frame rate. Uh, it will be screening. <laughs> we speak out and then just say, man, this is amazing. <laughs> Whoa, Look at the it's 420 p.m. Uh, <laughs> it's 450 theaters in North America that are going to have the HFR version of The Hobbit. Uh, so you'll want to check your local listings, or Scott Wilkinson recommended this, 48fpsmovies.com actually lists 
all of the places in the United States uh, where you will be able to see the high frame rate version of The Hobbit. Yeah, man. Actually, what's funny is I, I'm in, I'm going there right now to check where if my favorite uh, uh, movie theater, the Alamo Draft House, is on there. Oh, speaking of which, I have a story to talk about later when we talk about what we're watching. But um, I'm sure it has to be. I have to assume. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I... South Lamar and on South Slaughter Lane. Yeah, Slaughter Lane. That's dangerous. Don't drive there. Don't slaughter Lane. Uh, do you think there's going to be a, a geek revolt where people go in to see the uh, high frame rate version of The Hobbit? Nope, 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 nope. nope. What will happen is what looks bizarre and silly in a five-minute chunk and uh, will, over the three hours of the movie, hypnotize you. And by the time the movie's over, you will walk away feeling like you were transported, like you had a fundamentally different experience, kind of like Avatar. I mean, Avatar, of course, a lot of hay was made about the new 3D technology, and I genuinely felt like being in the movie theater for Avatar, even though, yes, it was a song we'd all seen and heard before a million times, uh, it was exquisitely well-produced, and it, and it felt like a unique and special experience. I think you're going to have that kind of experience with The Hobbit, and I think uh, there will be outliers who say how much they enjoy it. And I, I don't know that it'll change the world of cinematography, but I guarantee you that there are going to be outspoken people who advocate for getting the full uh, H, what is it, HFPS? What was it? HFR, H high frame rate. There you go, the HFR experience. Now remember, you can't get HFR and, uh, at, wait, wait a minute, what was it? There's 3D HFR. And then there's 3D not HFR. Then there's 2D. Then there's IMAX. And then some of any of those could have the Atmos sound system. So there's like 15 different combinations that you could have. I don't, I don't know if 15 is the right number, but lots of different combinations. So check your local listings very carefully. I think pre-orders are already on, on sale for the December 14th premiere. Dude, I believe it, man. It's it's going to be amazing. And actually, after seeing the trailer, uh, when I went to go see Wreck-It Ralph, uh, it uh, really looks awesome. I'm very excited about it. Louis C.K. is excited about his new HBO special. And you may say, oh, Mr. Mr. Internet, Mr. Go Straight to the People's putting his stuff on HBO. What's that about? Well, he tweeted, I'm doing a stand-up special for HBO. It will be available on louisck.com a few months after HBO globally for $5. No DMR. I think he meant DRM, but he did. <laughs> oh, did he say DM yeah. DM DMR? <laughs> uh, so, so, so he's he's. I don't know how he got HBO to agree to this, but he must have got the rights to this and said, "Yeah, HBO, you can show it. And I'll give you an exclusive for a couple of months. That's cool. Uh, but once you're done with your window, I'm taking it to the people." Yeah, well, good for him. And I'll tell you, once you've built a brand, and, and I know that we love to hold up Louis C.K. as this uh, this paragon of doing something that nobody's done before. Uh, people have been selling their own content for a long time, and, and there's some part of me that's a little bit annoyed. Like, he definitely built his brand and built his career on a very traditional business model for television. And it's that brand that now has enough value that he can get deals like this and can sell directly to the to, to the public. However, regardless of how he get, gets there, this is surely a better shake for the consumer than we would be offered with a uh, with a traditional uh, broadcaster deal. And apparently Ira Glass agrees because This American Life is taking their special uh, a pre presentation, I guess I'll call it, called Invisible Made Visible, which was streamed to theaters. Now, the, the, if you've ever been to some of these theaters where they have the, like, come to our special presentation of the Boston Symphony, it was one of those kinds of events. So you showed up and there was a live presentation of this this American Life's Invisible Made Visible. And that now they're taking that presentation to VHX.TV, who are going to make it available online later this month. Fans who pay $5 will be able to access full-length streams of the show as well as a DRM-free copy. Yeah, well, good. More The more the merrier, I say. And the Huffington Post is getting parodied in one of Amazon's originals, uh, I, I feel like it was only a year ago that we were talking about, you know what these, these streaming systems need to do more of? They need to do more originals. Hulu's awash in originals. They've beaten Netflix to this. They're, they're, they're all over the place. I was watching Misfits this week. Sure. And there were all kinds of ads in, in there for the other Hulu originals. Like they are, that's one of the things when you have ads, you can promote your own stuff. Uh, so it feels like Hulu's just like, wow, Hulu's almost like a channel of its own. Uh, Amazon's trying to do the same thing, commissioning original series. And one of the ones they're commissioning is called Browsers. 
and it takes place in a Huffington Post X Post esque website uh, revolving around I, I, four I interns. I liked everything about this except for the word musical in there. Musical comedy series, eh? Well, but huh. do you, okay, but do you do you hate the Saturday Night Live stuff when they do singing? Does that bug you? No, no. Okay. But so I, but, I'm guessing it's like that. Sure. I maybe I'm being too charitable. I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know. Don't like we'll a see. musical, Brian. I, I don't. I don't want to get bent out of shape about it because I don't know. All right, uh, and then finally, um, security now is filling in for Leo Laporte last week, and uh, Steve Gibson mentioned this. The Root Kit is on Kickstarter uh, by a guy named Jonathan Schieffer, who wants to do a video about kind of exploring hackers and and do it accurately, <laughs> and actually and actually go into like what could actually happen, how could people defend against it, uh, what could a Root Kit actually do. Uh, but, of course, he, he needs money to make the project happen. So it's one of those Kickstarter type of things that may or may not get backed. It's got 25 more days to go, so it's still too early to tell. Uh, but it's the root kit. In a cyber war, knowledge is the only weapon. Right on, dude. And uh, and actually, I snuck another story in here that you probably missed because uh, I did it last minute. But uh, right after frame rate, it was announced on io9 that uh, lock and key, uh, it is confirmed, is gonna uh, is looking to be a movie trilogy if you haven't read the lock and key comic books by joe hill uh son of stephen king uh, they're excellent they're phenomenal and i highly recommend you read them and i'm very excited that this is gonna it was it was uh, there was a pilot that didn't get picked up and there was talk about it being a CV, tv series but i think a, a movie trilogy would be a much better home for this story awesome good stuff that is not okay to remove i'm gonna take that out of our lineup that is an <laughs> awesome story I'm, I'm excited about that Right on, man. All right, let's uh, take a look at the NSFW show frame rate winner movie draft. Those of you who dislike the movie draft, please fast forward to me. I am excited because we are now getting in to Twilight Land. By the end of next week, Sarah Lane will be the the leader with with the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part Two. But you how so? much will she lead by, Brian Brush? Would you have two hundred thirty-four million? Yeah, there's no way she's she won't be a leader in one week, maybe two weeks. Nah, you're no- right. You're right. You you have you and Father Robert actually both one ninety-one million. He she won't catch it one week. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, man. Uh, the big news is, of course, Scott's pick with Skyfall is tearing it up. What ninety million dollars? Ninety in the million fr- in the first weekend, and I saw it. It was awesome. It's uh, is it good? Is it worth? Uh, it's worth- very good. Uh, you know, there's people who just don't like James Bond, and I can't, I can't say, oh, this is one of those movies that just stands on its own. It is very James Bond. But if you like James Bond at all, this may, this is definitely one of the best James Bond movies I've ever seen. That's awesome. Does uh, does this cement Daniel Craig's place in the pantheon? Is he is he the the first among many Bonds? I think it puts him. I, you know, that's it's so controversial. I'm not even sure I want to invite the email about it, but. <laughs> I, I'll say Connery-ish. Like, he's he's definitely up 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 there now, for sure. Right on, man. No, that's exciting. Uh, I don't so, know yeah, what, so what, that's, that's pretty much the only movie that, that matters, and it's the only, yeah. <laughs> it's oh, the only movie of the draft that's coming uh, out this week. We should point out that uh, Lincoln is in very limited release right now. I think it's only in eight theaters, which is why you're seeing, uh, like, 944. Yeah, pounds. that's kind of freaky to see that low of a number, but it's you have to take that into account. Sure, sure. But that'll be interesting. Lincoln and Skyfall and Breaking Dawn Part 2 all in the same weekend making money next week or this weekend. That'll be interesting. Let's take a look at what we're watching. We won't take a look at it. We'll just talk about it. Because we already looked at it. What we're watching. So, Brian Brushwood. Yeah. uh, We'll get to a spoiler zone on The Walking Dead later. Of course. But... Got stuff to say about The Walking Dead. What so. else have you been watching? Uh, still watching Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, this week's was not as good as the previous weeks, um, but it's still still very good. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been live streaming The Walking Dead video game. That's been a lot of fun because, especially for an adventure game, uh, number one, the story is phenomenal. And I actually wonder if playing the video game with its amazing stories didn't maybe color my experience of watching the Walking Dead television show last night. But we'll talk about that in the spoiler zone. Uh, but also, I took Penelope to go see Wreck-It Ralph, which um, uh, I liked a lot, but I didn't love. The, dis- the, the, the difference is, in a lot of the Pixar movies, there's a moment 
when I suddenly realize that I'm just adrift in this other world and I've forgotten that I'm watching a movie and I'm utterly transported to a different place. Uh, that was not the case with Wreck-It Ralph. Now, keep in mind, if anyone's going to love this thing, I will, because it's got all this awesome retro video game humor. Uh, and, of course, I saw it at the Alamo Draft House, which for a half hour leading up to it played a bunch of the awesome old Atari uh, advertisements and ColecoVision ads and uh, awesome video game mashups. But, uh, but I liked it a lot but didn't love it. Uh, the big news, though, that I thought was interesting is uh, the Alamo Draft House, of course, has a very strict no talking policy. We talked about the uh, the lady who kept texting despite the fact that she was asked to stop or leave. And uh, they've added to that to where now, starting January 3rd, they are not going to allow for late arrivals. If you show up after the feature has started, you don't get to get in. Which I thought, I've never seen that for a movie before. That, that used to be like a, a, a gimmick for horror movies uh, back in the 50s. Like, you know, af after the, the, the blood-curdling scene, no one will be allowed in the theater. You know, that, 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 that was sort of a kind of a promotional aspect. But they're saying like, no, you know, this is like uh, the AT&T Park in San Francisco. We're not going to let people block your view of the, of the ball game. If the ball game's going on, you, you got to wait to go get your seat. They're saying the movie's going on. We're not going to stop the movie so you don't get to go in. Right, right. Well, and it was interesting. When I first saw that, I was like, oh, that's just going to piss people off. And it's like, I, is that really a problem? Is that an issue? And then uh, later that uh, during that same feature, there was a loud table behind me. And so for the first time ever, I wrote down loud table behind me and put it on the on the stand. Uh, so I guess uh, I guess it is. I mean, they, they do things very conscientiously. I mean, everything is about the quality of the presentation and of the end user experience at the Alamo Draft House. So, so, you, so uh, you're getting old is what you're saying. Uh, maybe. I am. It's, I am getting It's old. too loud. Therefore, Descartes proved. They're too loud. The people behind me. The movie was great. I uh, Turn up the movie, I say. Uh, just another mo another piece on Skyfall. Uh, somebody pointed out that Judy Dench stole the show. Uh, absolutely. 100% agree. Javier Bardem also stole his segments. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of thieving going on in this movie. Uh, I, but it, they were saying this in the chat room, like Daniel Craig really wasn't that great, or at least they were sort of implying that. I think they all were fantastic. I, I can't say enough about how much I enjoyed that movie. You might not. You might hate it. That's fine. Uh, I also, uh, Haven got renewed for a second season. I'm very excited about this. This is their best season ever. It's the most Stephen Kingish season. They're really getting into the Colorado Kids story more. Uh, they're actually leaving Haven a little bit. Uh, really enjoying that. Very much enjoying the last season of Fringe. I haven't been talking about Fringe as much because I'm just savoring it. I'm just, I don't want it to go. And so I'm just kind of like keeping it in my head uh, and, and just enjoying every last moment of it. It's like, it's like holding a, a, a lovely whiskey in your mouth and just tasting every little little bit of it. Oh, no, I could totally. I mean, that's uh, when you know you're almost out. That's how I was when uh, the, the end of the Dark Tower series was coming at me. I read as slowly as I possibly could those last few books. And I do want to apologize. There are people who ask if I've could, if I ever got back to watching Fringe, at this point, it's just so daunting. Like, just to get through the first three seasons, I'm going to have to watch 60 episodes. It's just insane. Like, and I know by the end, when you have that backstory and that context, it must be amazing what you're experiencing right now. But I just feel like it's it's just too late for me to get that same experience as you guys. No, I, th I think you can. But at this point, I'd say just wait for it all to come out and then just watch it in a row. There you go. And don't, See, don't worry I, I, about I, I, having, having to catch it on, online. Uh, I also watched the first episodes of Babylon 5, Chips, The Dead Zone, Misfits, Twin Peaks, and Futurama, Brian. Oh, these were all for your... Uh, for autopilot. Uh, we, just, auto uh, we just started recording season two. Uh, had a, had, we knocked out six episodes on Saturday, and they were all fun. They were all a blast. Uh, so so I, you're going to hear that I'm watching a bunch of unrelated pilots of various uh television shows but i didn't know about the dead zone man that is a good series uh, i think i sort of dismissed it when i saw promos of it because it has anthony michael hall in it but right. you can't you, you it's not the 16 candles anthony michael hall he's he's amazing he's good and he doesn't look like anthony michael hall anymore yeah well yeah that's uh, uh 15 years of living will do that to you also did not watch blood and chrome which by all accounts was amazing 
Am I really? dead? Am I dead inside, Brian? Did you watch it? No, no, no. To be honest, look, as as much as I have uh, enthusiasm and I want it to be amazing, there was a big part of me that just like didn't didn't trust. I was like, well, surely there's a reason they didn't put this on television, and surely it can't be that good. And so uh, now that I've heard that, that'll be the first thing I do tonight is check out Blood and Chrome. Yeah, some people said it was just amazing, great action. Uh, the podcast Tangential Convergence uh, that Dave Broadbeck and his friends do, uh, they, they had just watched it when they recorded their episode uh, last week, and they were all super excited about it. So I've, I've just been burned now, and I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm just hesitating. Plus, I've got all these pilots to watch, too. So. Yep, yep, yep. Let's move on to frame, uh, to feedback. To, to frame, Let's frame. finally do the show frame. Feedback with Brian and Tom on frame radio. Yeah. It's frame back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Marlon wrote in uh, and said in episode number 100, by the way, huge thanks to Len Peralta for the drawing uh, that, from episode 100. If you haven't checked it out, go find his poster. Uh, if you're watching the video episode, we're showing it right now. Uh, at uh, at, ju- at uh, lenperalta.com. Uh, re- really cool, really cool of him to do that. Marlon says, in episode 100, the issue of spoilers came up again, and a listener mentioned Argo. I went and watched Argo this last weekend, and what you said about it didn't spoil it at all. It's actually what got me interested in watching it. Up till that point, I wasn't interested, so instead of a spoiler, it was, what's the antonym for spoiler? Not sure. Fresh? It was fresh. It was fresh, dope, funky fly is what he wanted to say. Well, and that's the thing, right? Any trailer, any explanation of a movie that is meant to get you to go watch it will spoil something. It's sure. all The discussion is all about the line. It's all about where's the line. Sure. Well, and, and there's no doubt that, uh, that you know, uh, uh, Jeff Kanata, we accidentally spoiled. Like, he had kept himself pure and had not seen a single trailer, a single frame of anything of Inception. All he knew is that he knew that he trusted Christopher Nolan to blow his mind and he was going to go in cold. And then we accidentally showed him the, the, the trailer. And so, uh, like, and likewise, my buddy Brady, when he saw Looper, knew nothing about it. And there's there's got to be something special about that pure blank slate experience of tearing open a present and having no idea what's inside there. Uh, Stuart wrote us, hey, speaking of spoilers, I'm much more annoyed by visual spoilers, i.e. trailers. Knowing one thing will happen is bad enough, but when I have seen the ending to almost every shot in a movie, it really starts to get annoying. Hey, I remember that bus. It explodes in the trailer. Blam! Oh, just tell me who wrote and directed a movie. That's enough to assume how good it'll be. And he says, uh, and don't say spoilers are more spo- or trailers are more spoiled for nowadays. I'm pretty sure I've seen some over five minute trailers from the 1950s. Oh yeah, yeah. No-, no, that's a really good point. They've always been spoilery. In fact, I think they've gone through periods where they were more spoilery in the past. Absolutely. Uh, than, than they were now. Uh, Patrick says, true that the Netflix interface on TiVo sucked big for a long time, but a couple months ago it changed to be much more Roku-like. We have a TiVo premiere and two Roku boxes, and the Netflix interfaces are more comparable than ever. I, I was just going by what they said in the update. They said that the update improved the Netflix interface. So if you think it got better two months ago, apparently it got even betterer. Better, rur, 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 rur. Uh, and I'll tell you what, this is one we got. We got two kind of long ones here. Somebody, uh, uh, <laughs> David Knight sent his experience of uh, cutting the cord and then getting called by the cable company and then at trying to seduce him back. They were offering deals that were actually better than new customers. So apparently there's some interesting stories of uh, and I'd love to I'd love to hear more of these. I think that's uh, always but- been happening. Right. You know, if you threaten to cancel or you cancel, they they suddenly find crazy special offers. I've had that experience with DirecTV before, sure. where I called to just cancel a part of a service, and they're like, what if we gave it to you free for six months? And I'm just like, right. no, no. I just want so, to get it out of my life. We also got an interesting annoyed email from Tyler, who, uh, due to the fact that he's trying to work from home, needed to get a Comcast commercial account for his uh, internet service. And because he got the commercial account, he asked, is this a dedicated line? And he was annoyed to find out, and this is my understanding of the email as best he wrote it. I, I apologize if I didn't quite get what you were heading at, Tyler. But it sounds like he's mad because the service he bought allows his traffic priority over the rest of his neighborhoods. 
In other words, uh, well, here, the forwarded message here is, Tyler, this is not a point-to-point -point fiber connection, but Comcast is, as you probably already know, a proprietary network. Furthermore, as a Comcast business class customer, you receive 24-7 priority on the network. What, what that means to you is because you are surrounded by our residential customers, your data will always fly first. Some of the residential customers have Comcast Blast, which allows them to receive increased bandwidth when uploading or downloading large files. You, on the other hand, will always have priority and will be offered the fastest available connection at any given time, often exceeding the 50, uh, or the 50 10 connect speeds we discussed, blah, 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 blah. And it sounds like he's annoyed, like this is a... Um, I think what uh, he's saying, he had to get Comcast business because he wanted a static IP address, which is, I, I have Comcast business account for similar types of reasons. Uh, sure. And, and so they're telling him... In an explanation, like your 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 traffic's prioritized. Don't worry, you're you're always going to get the fastest available connection, uh, no matter what. Even if you're sharing it with residential customers, and he's saying violation of net neutrality. And the fact is, that's not a violation. That's that's called quality of service management. Uh, and as long as they're not promoting certain traffic because it's video or because it comes from Comcast. Uh, that it's not violating net neutrality. You can you can do quality of service management. In fact, you need to do quality of service management to to, to make a good a well running network. And if you pay for different speeds, that's how you get different speeds. You know, and and we've we've agreed that you know paying more to get 50 megabits per second over 25 megabits per second is perfectly reasonable. That's how they do it. So yes. Yes. Well, I thought that was an interesting and principled uh, argument on his behalf, but uh, but no, I agree. He's got he's got the, he's coming from the right place. Like, wait a minute, don't don't break net neutrality to favor me. But I don't think they're breaking net neutrality in this case. No, well, that's true. I think you should break net neutrality to favor me, Brian Brushwood. That's that's always been my policy. Is so break in favor me. Break speed limits, net neutrality, yes. whatever you have to do to deliver gifts to Brian Brushwood. Is that what that's, you're saying? That's always been my policy. That's a, and, it, and that's, a, that's it's in the EULA that you agreed to the first time we shook hands. I forgot to mention by shaking I, my hand. Oh, you know, I forgot the first time we shook hands. I was wearing my EULA shirt that absolves me of any EULAs in the area. So uh, Yeah, but I was wearing underwear Actually, that said uh, no EULA uh, uh, retroactive absorption clause. Yeah, shall but mine be. says no retroactive absorption clause no negatories will be accepted as a part of this EULA. So. Yeah, but I had my fingers crossed behind my back, so yeah, there. Yeah, I actually was sending a clone rather than myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got nothing. <laughs> uh, frame rate as show at gmail.com or frame rate at twit.tv. Make sure to send us. We're getting some really good emails. And I like that people are sending us stories nowadays as well. Just stuff yeah, that they cool. across that they think we're gonna like. Awesome stuff. I'll try to pay attention to the lineup so we can we can read them. Uh, <laughs> you can find us on the web twit.tv slash fr. You can watch us live on Mondays at 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and of course, uh, you can uh, find us at live.twit.tv when that happens. Brian Brushwood, I will see you next week with Scott I'll Wilkinson. See you next week. What? Mm -hmm. Scott Wilkinson will be live. He'll be right there. Stop punching yourself. <laughs> All right. I believe we're hopping into the spoiler zone. Hang tight. Here we go. Silent Green is people! All right, so uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, we, we have actually quite a few people here. Do, do any of you not want to be spoiled on The Walking Dead? I definitely want to be spoiled on The Walking Dead. You want to be spoiled on The Walking Dead. Okay, like, good. Yes, please. I just want to make sure that we don't, we're not accidentally spoiling anybody. Is Jason securely put on his headphones? I'm, uh, I'm clear. Okay, he's clear. All right, we're good. Uh, you know, it was interesting... Brian, you I, you put a bunch of notes in the lineup earlier today just, just so you wouldn't forget. And so I actually got an insight into what you thought of the episode. And it is about 50% exactly what I thought and then 50% kind of far from what I thought, although not exactly the opposite. Okay, well, do, do you want me to go first or you want to go first? Why don't first? you go first? Okay, well, uh, spoiler alert, uh, this was the least strong episode of the entire third season. If if this had been in the second season, I would have called it a bad episode, but but I'm but I'm so happy with how stuff's going in general in the third season. And the main reason is because all of the characters, uh, first of all, the episode went nowhere. Nothing advanced. And all you saw was a bizarre exercise in having uh, all of the weakest characters or, or having everybody 
perform in a way that they were least competent to. Just as I totally, totally believed the utter despair as Rick was wailing at the end of last episode, I did not believe at all crazy Rick. And I didn't, uh, and the other problem was the opening was such a wasted opportunity. They just, they're like, oh, by the way, he's, uh, he's in love with his uh, zombie daughter. Uh, that just, just FYI. There, I'll just throw that out there, and then it'll, then we'll do nothing with it. And then, likewise, uh, they also wasted the uh, the Friday Night Lights experience of the zombie torture uh, that they have going on. Because if your goal is to make us horrified by the residents of Woodbury, then you need to not make it such a sensible presentation of this. Like, uh, in and and again, don't know how much of this is me being polluted by the comics, but. When you went in to Woodbury in the comics, you you hoped everything was right, but you feared something might be wrong underneath, and you found a deep darkness in the people there. This uh, with their gladiator battles that they were doing, uh, you didn't get that sense. You spent too long in the television show getting to know these people and understanding. And when it came to this moment, when all of a sudden you know uh, uh, Merle's this superstar one handed gladiator, uh, I kind of got it. I'm like, yeah, man, that's not so bad. This ain't so weird. And all of a sudden I realized, like, why are they even doing this then? If, if they're trying to set up a future battle between Woodbury and our friends over at the prison and we don't know who to root for, then in that case, why, why even bother having Michonne running around saying there's a darkness under here? There's something – essentially all they're doing is alienating me from everyone. Like, I, I trust Michonne less. Like, like, she's not my surrogate there. Uh, who's disgusted by the residents of Woodbury. And I, but I don't like the residents of Woodbury any better. It's, it, they, they got nothing. They wasted, they wasted all this time and essentially advanced nothing in this past episode. Um, and I, I will say this much, that the governor, uh, his trial period is over in my book and I'm just really left wanting. It's just, he's, he's a, a milk toast politician um, who's weak of character that I'm not frightened by. Uh, the, what, what did I write here? I wrote down, and I wrote this down as soon as it happened. I said, uh, oh yeah, he's not the charming, seductive, pragmatic terror from the comics. And, uh, and I'm bummed that it doesn't look like he's going to turn into that guy anytime soon. Brian, your ad hoc attacks on the governor... Uh, show the electorate. That, oh wait, the election season is over. That's not weird. Uh, weird, weird. <laughs> but no, I actually agree with you on the governor. That's that's one of the parts where I'm like, yep, he is just not it. And that's why I still think and hope that Merle ends up sort of taking over because he's just the governor's just way too friendly. I disagree that they wasted the uh, revelation about the daughter. I thought that worked really well. In fact, it freaked Eileen out. She wasn't see because I, I saw it coming. As soon as he started to brush hair, I'm like, oh, I know what this is. Uh, and I, I, I thought it was good. But I will agree with you that I don't think it was wasted with the revelation, but then they didn't follow up on it. You needed to have Michonne discover her or something. Like, that's what I thought was happening when Michonne, Michonne broke into the apartment. I was like, oh, she's going to find the daughter. But then she just found, you know, a bunch of very sensibly caged uh, experimental subjects and, and sort of randomly killed them, which I'm like, well, that. You know, I mean, that was actually probably a good idea to have a few around just to experiment on. I mean, well, Carol was doing that at the prison. Why was why was that not weird, right? But, and especially like like okay, la have her do it, but at least have her, uh, us understand why. You know, but but as far as she knew, she didn't even know what they were there for. So as far as she knew, they would have been there for experiment and decided to slaughter him anyway. In which case, I'm like, man, you're just a bad guest. And I, then and, that, and again oh, with the with the uh, with the Friday Night Lights thing with with the uh, with the demonstration. I, I agree that it could have been sicker. It could have been darker. I mean, they have gone much darker. In, in other was, places in the same episode, they went darker. Uh, was, and, and this was a little bit light for that. But I, it's still, I still think it had the right effect, which is like, okay, these people are cheering for this. This is weird. It's kind of messed up. And I think it is our comic book sensibilities that makes us less impressed by it. Because, again, Eileen was watching it, and she's like, oh, that's, that's just sick. But the problem is, it's like they let's say if the goal of that is to horrify us, then uh, like I found myself rooting for uh, for Merle is is the happiest <laughs> I've just seen him. You know, it's like uh, I I don't want uh, don't give me a moment I love if I'm supposed to be horrified by the scene. And also, and that's the other thing too is is it was fun to watch Merle as as you know top of the uh, oh and. 
It is fun to watch Merle play superstar there, but unfortunately, it's yet another example of everybody playing outside of their character for for this one episode. Now, this is going to be this is a comic book spoiler zone, okay? So, so if you extra don't wanna, spoiler just, zone, put your fingers in your ears or something. Just give me thirty seconds here. Um, way, way too early for the no. crazy. To- I, I dis- this one I definitely disagree with you. I was excited about that. Really? Yeah. Oh, I was like, oh. oh, yeah, we're bringing this early. Cool. And I think right. partly it was because this was a slow episode. Actually, about three quarters of the way through the episode, I turned to Eileen and I said, you know, this is uh, one of those episodes where nothing really happens, but the season has been so so good, I'm okay. I don't mind that nothing's happened. This is just getting me to the next episode. So when we got to the phone call at the very end, I was like, oh, I know who that is. I know who that is. I think they cut it off too early. I would have had I would have had you hear a voice yeah. so that you could start guessing who was on the other end. Yeah. And that isn't even comic book spoilery uh, to say. I, I I wish they would have done that because Eileen was like, who's on the phone? I'm like, well, I can't say anything to you now. So uh, here's the other thing that disappointed me was uh, I understood Rick going on a rampage, going in by himself to clean out the the whole prison of all the zombies, getting it out of his system. Uh, but considering that they had made it pretty clear that Lori and Rick's relationship had cooled off considerably, they were pretty much business partners in the raising of this new kid by the end of it. And considering how pragmatic they've been about every other death in the entire series, no, 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 no. Rick feels yeah. guilty. Rick feels guilty that he didn't repair the relationship with Lori, that he was but, pushing her away. Okay, but guilty to the point that he goes and 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 cuts out the partially digested corpse to get a few pieces of her to play with? That, uh, that's that's yeah. not... We've never seen anything like that. He's over the top, dude. And I'm not there. talking about getting rid of Cable. <laughs> I thought I thought there was uh, more consistent, believable ways to take that. I, I was not. I, a f- I just I, I I see where you're coming from. I disagree with you there. I I think that that was showing that Rick really wanted to mend fences with Lori. He was trying to teach her a lesson uh, by keeping her away. Because remember, at that one point, he starts to say something to her, and then he turns away. And she was always looking to him for something. And now he feels like I will never be able to resolve this. I will never be able you know, to come to, to come to peace with Lori one way or another. Like, I, I never took that chance to, to resolve those feelings, even if it was that we become business partners. I don't think they ever got to that stable part. I think they, they had tons of issues, and now he's just devastated because the mother of his, of his daughter, his partner, he pushed away, pushed away, pushed away, and now she's gone. And I think that's why he went and cut open the zombie, because he's just wild with grief. Yeah, and and I can believe wild with grief. I don't believe cartoon craziness, and this was just cartoon craziness. I, for me. I didn't see it as cartoon craziness, but that's all right. You mm. can be wrong. Yeah, it's a, it happens from time to time. <laughs> all right. Anything else on uh, on Walking Dead? No, uh, but I will. And again, I don't know. I, I will say this much: if you're playing the, vi- if if you have enjoyed the story, highly, highly recommend the video game by Telltale Games. Uh, it's utterly phenomenal. Uh, and it's agonizing. It's one thing to watch the agonizing choices that people make in the comic book and the television show. It's another thing to have to make the agonizing choices. Written yourself. by Gary Whitta, right? Uh, yeah, I believe I believe he was a, a story consultant overall. Yeah. Uh, they list some other writers for the episodes, but I mean, he's he's the, sort of the main thrust yeah. on that. Very cool. All right, that's it for our spoiler zone. Thanks everybody uh, for watching or listening, and we'll be back again with an all new frame right next week.